Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, then you'll find Ruth. Ruth, the first chapter, verses 1 through 7. And when you have found this passage of scripture, please let it be known by saying amen. Amen. I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And the word of the Lord reads, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab, and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. This morning I want to preach from the title, From Poverty to Promise. From Poverty to Promise. Before we preach, let us pray. Eternal God, as we stand before your open word, we pray at this moment that your word be applied to our hearts and to our minds and to our souls, that we may live out your word according to your will and your way. This prayer we humbly offer in the majestic name in the precious name, in the almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And may the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Poverty is one of the greatest problems on this earth. It is one of the greatest problems in the United States. It has now been seen that 10% of the population of the United States now controls over 50% of the wealth. 10% of the people control over 50% of all the resources. And when we look at poverty throughout the world, we find in places such as India that homelessness has reached 400 million people. To give you a sense of how many people 400 million is, if the United States had the same population of homeless people that India has, then that would mean everyone in the United States, from the president to the poorest, would be homeless because the population of the United States is 400 million. And the truth is, nothing matters when poverty is what is in front of us. Nothing matters whenever people are hungry. Nothing else matters when people are starving. Philosophy, economics, politics, not even theology matters when people don't have food on the table. People could care less 
about who sits in the Oval Office or who sits in the governor's mansion when they don't have food in their stomachs. But there is another kind of poverty. It is the worst kind of poverty of all. It is not a poverty of the pocket. It's a poverty of the soul. Poverty of the soul is the kind of poverty that leads to self-hatred and low self-esteem. And self-hatred and low self-esteem leads to violence and self-destruction. Poverty of the soul is the kind of poverty that allows you to have money in the bank, but you still can't get a decent night's sleep. Meaning that you can be rich and still live in poverty. But having poverty of the soul won't keep you out of church. We all know this. It's very common for people to spend all of their lives in the church hearing about God, even singing about God, and still not have the love of God in their hearts. So often I hear people say to me, Pastor Grimes, I don't want to go to church because there are too many sinners in the church. My response is, well, where do you expect sinners to go? (laughs) That's what the church is for. Saying that you don't want to go to church because there are sinners in the church is the same as saying that you don't want to go to the hospital because there are other sick people in the hospital. That's what hospitals are for. Poverty of the soul is a dangerous thing. Because it is possible to have money in your pocket, but still go straight to hell when you have poverty of the soul. It is much better to have empty pockets, but have the love of God in your heart, than to have money in the bank and have no love at all. Because there is something that money cannot buy, and that's peace. Money can't buy peace. If peace was for sale, there would be no wars in the world. But peace is not for sale. And that is the great tragedy of that so-called prosperity gospel of the past 30 years. I'm going to call that so-called gospel what it is. It wasn't the gospel, but it was garbage that was being preached. That so-called health and wealth gospel that was telling people that somehow they could treat the Lord like a lottery ticket. But the Lord doesn't work that way. And at the end of the day, no amount of wealth can buy peace. No amount of money can place peace in our household or peace in our heart. And everybody wants peace, whether they admit it or not. Everybody wants to live peacefully. And we are promised peace. As the people of God, God promised us peace. We can move from poverty of the soul to the promises of God. But this movement requires commitment. The movement from poverty of the soul to the promises of God is a movement from low self-esteem to a healthy self-esteem. It is a movement from self-destruction to kingdom building. But this movement requires commitment. This movement requires an unwavering faith. And of course, the question question is this morning, how do we do this? How do we find this unwavering faith to move from poverty of the soul to the promises of God? Well, the answer is simple. We have to find a good example. We have to find an example of someone who has made this movement. And some 4,000 years ago, we find one of the greatest examples there was. There is a very great example that we find of how we make this movement from poverty of the soul to the promises of God. It is a shining example that was set forth by one of the greatest human beings in history and by one of the greatest women in all of scripture, a woman by the name of Ruth. Her story is familiar to many of us, but there are some unfamiliar details of her story which will help us this morning. Her name in Hebrew means companion or friend, 
And her story begins with, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The very first verse of her story sets a scene of danger and unrest because we are told that it is a day in which the judges ruled the land. And the influence and the power of the judges had weakened by this time. While there had been great judges such as Samson and Deborah and Barak and Gideon, by the time we reach the book of Ruth, the influence and the power of the judges had become weak. There was a great amount of disrespect and criminal behavior all throughout the land of Judah. And this time was especially dangerous for women to be alone. If anyone wants to know how dangerous, I invite you when you have an opportunity to read the last two chapters of the book of Judges. You will read in the end of the book of Judges one of the most violent and one of the most perverse crimes that ever occurred in all 66 books of the Bible. It is a crime called the crime in Gebeah. And that gives you a sense of how dangerous it was for a woman to be alone during the time of the judges. Yet and still, the book of Ruth is set in such a time and place. And the story goes on to tell us that the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. Amen. And they were Ephratites from Bethlehem and Judah. Amen. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. Amen. When you see that word Ephratite, it's important to know that the original name of the town of Bethlehem is Ephra. If you read of this town in Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy or Joshua or Judges, you will find the name Ephrat is used. So what this passage is saying is that Naomi and Elimelech and Malon and Kilion were born and raised in Bethlehem because to be called an Ephratite meant you were a native. Another way of putting it is this way. People who don't know would say that Peter's Tabernacle is in Wallace. But I learned after being there for now almost 19 years, having been there under my father and having now been blessed to serve there, Amen. that no one who lives around Peter's Tabernacle calls it Wallace. The Postal Service might call it Wallace. The IRS and the bill collectors might call it Wallace. But the truth is we can tell if you are an insider or not. Because everyone knows once you pass Rockfish and once you go past Safe, before you get to 421, that's Iron Mine. No one mentions Wallace. So if you say Wallace, we know you're an outsider because everyone on 41 West knows that's Iron Mine. And so when we see the word Ephratite here, that's insider language, meaning they were born and raised in Bethlehem. I wanted to explain that because it's a dangerous thing to skip over things we find in scripture. A whole lot of trouble gets started when we skip over verses and skip over words. They went into the country of Moab, the Bible tells us, and they remained there. And to give you a sense of how this looked on the map, the country of Moab today is called the Kingdom of Jordan, meaning they were leaving Bethlehem and going to an area now that is close to Saudi Arabia. So this was a very dangerous thing for them, being from Judah, going to a land that was filled with persons who today we call Arabs. So that's what's meant there. I know we see a lot of names and a lot of places in the Bible, but I just want to make it as plain for you as I can. So that's what they were doing. They were going to an Arab nation. And then this passage continues by saying, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi died, and she was left with her two sons. And these took Moabite wives, and the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And when they had lived there about 10 years, the Bible tells us that Malon and Kilion also died. What's so amazing here is something that we may overlook. Malon and Kilion were from Judah, and they had taken Moabite wives. They had taken wives who were from another culture, another country, and who had been brought up with another religion. Amen. Meaning that once Orpah and Ruth married Malon and Kilion, they had to take the religion and the culture of their husbands, which they did. You see, love does that. That means they had an understanding of what marriage means. That means they understood marriage is more than just exchanging vows. Marriage is more than just uttering some words. 
But marriage is a complete commitment first to God, and then it is to extend that love to God's people, to your spouse, to your spouse's family, to your own family, to your community. You see, marriage is not just between two people. Every marriage should be a love triangle, meaning God first, then the husband, and then the wife. And I'll just go ahead and make it plain. I know that I'm from Kimba, and I realize that you're in the middle district. I don't know where you stand on this thing, but I'll go ahead and let you know where I stand. I said husband and wife, not husband and husband or wife and wife, just so you can go ahead and know that. If you have a problem with that, I'm not changing that position because that's the Bible's position. And I see the exit, so if you want me to leave, I'll just go ahead and scoot out. But that's what the Bible says, husband and wife. And then the Bible says that both Malon and Kilion also died, so that Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. Naomi, now a widow, and her daughters-in-law, now widows, set out for Bethlehem to leave the land of Moab. In other words, they are now leaving this area in which they were in a foreign land, and Naomi was returning to her hometown. It is fitting because there was a famine in the land, and the name Bethlehem means the house of bread. So it was fitting that the Lord would be taking care of his people and making provisions for his people in the house of bread. You see, Naomi is from Bethlehem, but Naomi, being considerate of her daughters-in-law, realizes that Orpah and Ruth were born and raised in Moab. You see, Orpah and Ruth had never gone to Bethlehem, and so Naomi is considerate of the fact that they were raised in a different culture. And because Orpah and Ruth's husbands had passed away, they were no longer obligated to follow the religion of their deceased husbands. However, what we find here is Ruth had completely accepted the religion of her husband. You see, though Naomi did not want her daughters-in-law to live in poverty, and she wanted them to live in security, Ruth did not see security in the same terms that Naomi saw it. You see, Naomi was understandably heartbroken and discouraged. Even the word she uses by the end of the first chapter is bitterness to describe the way in which she feels that the Lord has dealt with her because her life has become so hard. And she does not want her daughters-in-law to have to go through the same thing that she is now going through. In other words, she realizes that Orpah and Ruth are young enough to find new husbands and to stay in the land in which they've grown up. And Naomi is content to go back by herself. And life gets that hard sometimes. Life gets so hard that we become convinced at times that things will never get any better. But Ruth had a faith that went beyond what the eyes can see. Ruth understood that the God we serve is not only God on a sunny day, but the God we serve is so powerful and so mighty and so merciful that he's just as good on a rainy day as he is on a sunny day. You see, Ruth was not concerned with the poverty of her pocket because she was concerned with the wealth of her soul that she had in keeping the promises of God. Life does get hard sometimes. Our loved ones will go on and leave us and go on to the other side to wait for us. And sometimes the things that we work so hard for and that we hope for don't turn out the way that we would like them to. Our minds get weighed down at times and our bodies begin to ache and there's sickness. But even in the midst of that, there is hope. Yes, even in the midst of pain, there is hope. Even in the midst of misery, there's recovery. Even in the midst of poverty, There is promise. But what we must do is what Ruth did. What we must do is endure and live in the fullness of God's promises. You see, Ruth had taken the religion of her late husband to heart. Ruth had taken the religion of Naomi to heart. So Ruth committed her heart and her life and her mind and her soul to the promises of God, which also meant loving God's people. Come what may. No matter how hard it gets, no matter what happens to us, no matter how much pain we endure, 
we must be committed to not only loving God, but loving God's people. That's why Ruth could tell Naomi, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Ruth had a faith that even amidst the famine of the land, she could still see the promises of God. And even during a time in which judges were ruling over the land, Ruth's faith was unwavering and unshakable. Even amidst the death of Elimelech, and the death of Malon, and the death of Kilion, Ruth could still see that there was life even in the midst of death, that there was promise even in the midst of poverty. And the Lord then brings Ruth out of poverty into his promises. When we look at that, there's something very important that happens with Ruth. You see, Ruth, being a Moabite, was already a distant relative of God's family. And by that, I mean some of us may know that the Moabites were descendants of Lot. But Lot had what we call an incestuous relationship with his daughters. And that's where the Moabites come from. And Ruth, being a Moabite, she was a distant relative. But you see, even in the midst of this famine and this poverty, the Lord does something with Ruth. You see, in Ruth going back to Bethlehem with Naomi, she meets someone when she gets there. Now we all know that Abraham married Sarah and that they had two sons, Ishmael and then Isaac. We know that Isaac married Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah had Esau and Jacob. And then Jacob, by way of Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah, had 12 sons. We may know some of them. Reuben and Simeon. Most of us know Joseph and Benjamin, Gad and Asher, Dan, Naphtali, Issachar, Levi. But the fourthborn is who we want to pay attention to. You see, the fourthborn is Judah, and Judah marries Tamar. And whenever Judah marries Tamar, they have a son named Peretz. Now, Peretz is the father of Hezron. And Hezron is the father of Aram. And Aram is the father of Aminadab. Aminadab is the father of Nashon. And Nashon is the father of Salmon. Salmon is the father of Boaz. And Boaz is who Ruth meets. But that's not the end of the story. You see, whenever Boaz and Ruth get together, then they have a son named Obed. And Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse was born and raised in Bethlehem. And he had eight sons. And the youngest of his sons was named David. David was anointed to be king. And he was a great king. But one afternoon, he got himself in a little trouble with the wife of Uriah. And he and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, had two children. The first was stillborn, and the second was named Jedidiah. But Jedidiah's name was changed to Solomon. Solomon, who's the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was an evil king, and Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asaph, and Asaph was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of King Uzziah. King Uzziah was the father of Joram. Joram was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. And Manasseh was the father of King Ammon. King Ammon was the father of King Josiah. King Josiah had two sons. The oldest son was named Yehoatz. His name was changed to Shalom. Shalom reigned for three months and was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar I. And then Jehoiakim, Josiah's second oldest son, sat on the throne for one year, and Nebuchadnezzar II deposed him. Then came King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah had seven sons. Nebuchadnezzar put all seven to death and took Zedekiah off into Babylon. But over in Babylon, King Jeconiah stayed alive and gave birth to a son named Shealtiel, who sometimes called Salathiel. And Salathiel is the father of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is the father of Abiud. And Abiud is the father of Eliakim. Eliakim is the father of Azar. Azar is the father of the priest Zadok. Zadok is the father of Akim. Akim is the father of Eleazar. Eleazar is the father of Mathan. Mathan is the father of Jacob. Jacob is the father of a man named Joseph. At the age of 30, Joseph became the husband of a woman named Mary. And Mary is the mother of Jesus. And the same God. And the same God who was with Ruth is the same God who's with all of us right now. He's the same God who gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's why we can sing, my father is rich and houses and land. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hand, rubies and diamonds, silver and gold. 
His coffers are full. He has riches untold, a tent or a cottage. Why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing. Oh, glory to God. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. With Jesus, my savior. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. With Jesus, my savior. I'm a child of the king. The doors are open this morning.